hello everyone. My name is Josh Furman. I work for technical support for Meyer Sound. Uh, we're so excited for you to be here. Welcome to the Space Map Go System Design Roundtables. So today we're talking about system design uh, for immersive audio systems. With this roundtable, uh, I have some primary panelists. Uh, I have Mr. Bob McCarthy, Director of System Optimization. Bob is doing the heavy lifting today and he's going to present. And then we also have Yanina Canales, Application Architect and Spatial Audio Specialist for Meyer Sound. And then we have Jose Gavin, Technical Support Specialist for Meyer Sound. And Jose is also one of the product developers for Space Map Go as well. And so today we're going to be discussing a lot of things uh, and introducing these sort of design fundamentals for Space Map Go. Last Last year, in the, at the end of the year, we did the Space Map Go roundtables for the Space Map Go application itself. We go into a lot of detail about what Space Map Go is, how you can use this free update to your Galaxy to turn your Galaxy into an immersive audio platform. Uh, it's a free application. So be sure to check out those roundtables at Thinking Sound on the YouTube page. And uh, there's also another website that is incredibly useful. It's the Space Map Go Help website. And this website is really a treasure trove of information for everything Space Map Go related. And what we're talking about today, the sound system design and sound design fundamentals, that can be found under the sound design tab of the Space Map Go Help website. In addition, we also have the MeyerSound.com contact form. This is great for when you have feature requests or bug reports. Um, if you have a feature request or a bug report, this is the best way to get in contact with us. We want to hear from you. We want to, uh, once you get your hands on Space Map Go, we want to hear your thoughts and we want to make this product work for you. With that in mind, uh, here's what we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to review what a space map is and some of the differences. Then we're going to introduce you to the design steps and guidelines that Bob has uh, come up with. And then uh, we're going to talk about picking the right speaker. And so uh, most of the time will be spent on loudspeaker design. But before we get into that, the first rumor that came, we've been hearing is that you need a lot of speakers to use Space Map Go. Well, that's not the case at all. You can actually use any number of loudspeakers and make a space map out of it. As we stated before, a space map is a visual representation of a loudspeaker system, and you can do anything with this visual representation. And the cool part about a space map is that it's an abstraction of a loudspeaker layout. So that means that unlike every other object-based platform out there, if I move my finger to the top left corner in a normal object-based platform, it's always gonna come out of that top left speaker or the front speaker on the front of my stage. With the space map, it doesn't have to be that. And just to show you and bring home that point, and since this is a live mixing tool, you can use this live mixer on your iPad and manipulate sound in real time for bands uh, and all sorts of other uh, live events. You can also do all of the same theatrical programming that you would be used to with previous generations of Space Map. So here we have a stereo system and map. Let's say I just have two speakers. Well, you can build a space map that would consist of a left and a right speaker. And you can actually use the space map you see here on the left. Um, you could use it to pan left and right. What's cool about this with silent nodes, you can now use your X axis for panning left and right as you would on a traditional pan pot. But now you can use the Y axis, the up down axis to control gain levels of whatever channel the space map is on. And the same thing goes when talking about a visual abstraction of a loudspeaker layout. Here's those same two loudspeakers represented in a space map, but in a completely different way. Here we have a space map on the right that I don't know why you would do this, but it's completely possible with the abstraction. And, and that's the beauty of space map. And so this behavior relationship of the panner um, within uh, this channel would be completely different than the space map you see on the left. And so that can be expanded. Let's say you have a left center right system. Well, uh, for a visual representation of the space, we could easily make a space map that has a left, a center and a right speaker. And that way, if I move my finger to the center, it would go to the center speaker. If I move my finger to the left speaker, it would pan hard left. And if I move in between, it would pan in different ways. 
Well, we can do that in a completely different way as well. So we can build another space map that actually has a left uh, speaker down in the bottom. And we have the center up front and a, another speaker on the right. The beauty of space map is this abstraction because no longer are you bound by traditional object-based methods. Now you can make a space map that allows you as the live mix engineer to mix your show fast and incredibly easily. And you can get some incredibly powerful results. And so let's expand this concept a little bit further. Here's a frontal system. Frontal systems are all the buzz right now in the industry. And uh, what I have is I randomly just put seven speakers. Uh, they're not spaced out properly or whatever, um, but this could be any number of speakers. This could be two speakers, four, six, or even 25 speakers. It really doesn't matter. How you draw your space map determines how you control your system. And so here would be a frontal mixer and I can use this, what's called a collinear space map. You can actually find examples of this already built into the space map go template file. Um, but I could then again make this space map completely different and add abstraction. So here's that same those same speakers represented in a space map in a completely different way. This is our demo room, and this is a real world room in Nashville. Uh, if you are in the Nashville area, feel free to give your sales manager a call and we can uh, set up an appointment for you to come visit. In that room, we have a frontal system of five speakers. We also have some lateral surrounds, and then we have two overhead speakers, and then you see green subwoofers throughout. What's cool about it is it makes it easy to control. So on the left, we have a space map that represents the space. So I can move to the top left and it will always come out of that top left speaker and I can move it around and have surround sound. Well, that's really cool, but if I want more control of my loudspeaker system, I can sort of make a hybrid map. And we like doing this a lot in different venues. And here we have a hybrid map where we have those frontal speaker nodes moved to the middle of the space map. And then we have the lateral surround speakers uh, placed sort of a, where they would be physically. Then we have the overheads as well. And what's cool about this space map is now I can use the space map um, for frontal mixing. So if I want to easily mix and do what's, what's, what's hot in the industry right now and pan people throughout the space. So if my vo voice or uh, my vocal is on a tracking system on black tracks and they're walking across the stage, they could easily be tracked across the stage on black tracks, which would then spit out information into Space Map Go. And in a live mixing environment, they would just track and move around and the mix engineer wouldn't have to do anything. But if I wanted to move a sound effect out or I wanted to move a guitar or a reverb stem out into the space where my audience is, I could easily just also use my finger and pan them around uh, the surround area. So this is a cool hybrid map. And here we have the same loudspeakers represented in two completely different ways so that I have better control of my system as the live mix engineer. And that's the cool part about Space Map that separates us from everyone else is you can do abstractions and make these really powerful mixers and live mix environments for very simple yet powerful control of very large scale sound systems. But if you just have a Galaxy and two speakers, you can still use Space Map Go. We've talked enough about Space Map Go, the application. Let's talk about sound system design. And to do that, we have Mr. Bob McCarthy, uh, Director of System Optimization for Meyer Sound. Bob has come up with an amazing method and guidelines for system design. And I'm going to say hello, Bob, and uh, take it away. Um, hello, Josh. Thank you for the introduction. And um, welcome, everybody. I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm happy to share my ideas. I want you to understand that this is a design approach, but it is by no means any kind of requirement. It's just recommendations that we believe can create great results for you. But uh, you're free to move on to your own approach or take what you like and leave the rest, as a, as a famous old saying goes. Um, I'm going to go through um, a real basic design um, and show underlying concepts behind the design and the design approach. So we got some terminology just to get you through here. Lateral systems, by that you could call those surround systems, and I do sometimes use that word. I'm not real militant on my terminology, but lateral systems are the side surrounds and the rear surrounds, of course, the mains 
um, are the frontal system. Overhead systems are the systems that are over your head. And the main thing is where they're perceived. Lateral systems are perceived as sidewalls, essentially, and overhead systems are perceived as a ceiling. And we draw the line at 45 degrees from a listener is where you break between an overhead perception and a lateral perception. By fully granular, um, I mean that every loudspeaker can become a unique location. This differs from, say, a 5.1, where you have basically in the left direction or the right direction or behind you direction. We're instead going to go to very pinpoint spots, basically hours on a clock, and be able to move the sound around in that way. That's what I call a granular approach. As what Josh said, there's a million ways to design a system in terms of the loudspeakers, and then there's another million of ways to design them in terms of uh, the layout of the app. I'm going to leave it to Josh to do that million, and I will cover uh, an introduction to the first million here. Basically, the design goals of what I'm going to show you where we're going to end up is a multi-channel mains approach, which is to say that you're using your mains not where you're pushing all of the instruments or the things into all the speakers, you are subdividing them. I'm old enough to call it a wall of sound approach. That's kind of where I came from, uh, where I first heard my first multi-channel systems back in the 1970s with the Grateful Dead's wall of sound. Uh, it'll be a fully granular lateral and a fully granular overhead system and 360 degrees of low frequency coverage. So now let's ask the question, is this system design that you see right here, Space Map Go Ready? Uh, let's see, it's got one Galaxy output, one loudspeaker. The answer is no, because you can't move anything anywhere with just one speaker. Okay, we've got one output driving two speakers. Uh, that's close, but still, no, it's going to take you two outputs and two loudspeakers, and now you're ready to go. So anything more than this is just gravy. So when Josh said you can do it with any number of loudspeakers, I'm going to just qualify that any quantity of loudspeakers more than one. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at this. Here's a big concert system outdoors at the Roskilde Festival. Is this one space map go ready? The answer is yes. But then the question becomes, what are you going to do with that? Is a person over here going to hear the sound map uh, across these four mains, the outer mains, the inner mains, and the right inner mains. And the, do you think I have enough coverage for this mains to go all the way across and be covering these people? Wow, that is a tall order. So we have to think about this in our design of whether or not we can cover everybody, because if you're going to be mapping things around, then it has to be a similar sound that's moving, not it sounds like it fell into a gigantic hole over on the right side. So that's the kind of things that we're coloring our approach. So we're going to grapple with the question of correlated or uncorrelated signals. I've spent my lifetime, uh, if you're familiar with my work, of designing systems based on a correlated approach. You've got to uh, Led Zeppelin coming out of one speaker, and you're going to have Led Zeppelin coming out of the other. So you're going to design the system with that in mind, that those two systems are going to sum together and have all of the static features of correlated loudspeaker relationships, all the combing, all the coupling, or the isolation, those kind of concepts. If I add Led Zeppelin to Barry Manilow, oh, guess what? We are uncorrelated, OK? So that creates a different opportunity. If we want people to hear that great uh, mix together, we're going to have to cover uh, everybody with Led Zeppelin and cover them separately with Barry Manilow so they can hear those mixing together. So it's a difference between correlated systems that sum and uncorrelated systems that mix. And let's remember what the purpose of Space Map Go is. It's a mixing platform. It's a mixing tool. It's not to make your system have more uh, kick-ass coupling. We'll, we can do that on our own just fine without the help of a spatial mixing tool. So let's take a look at this, these kind of three approaches here. 
your basic mono system, and I've fanned the speakers out to make a point source array. That is what you want to use correlated signals to reproduce. A multi-channel system, you want to have uncorrelated systems because you can readily see with three speakers all facing the same place to have them all reproducing the same signal. Oh, that's called street fair sound approach. Uh, it's not a good plan. It's just going to be comb filters and the smart sound guy goes in and secretly disconnects at least one of those speakers. Uh, we've all probably seen that trick or maybe even done it. In the middle is stereo, which you can see I made a terrible mistake in my presentation here. I seem to have uncorrelated and correlated placed on top of each other. Well, of course, that's on purpose because that's what a stereo system is. It's, it's what is it? Is it Correlated, is it uncorrelated? Well, if you mix something in the center, that's correlated. If you pan it to the left or to the right, that's a uncorrelated approach. And that's, of course, the always the big problem with stereo systems is that they're uncommitted and they create their own set of headaches by not being able to go one direction or the other. When we look at a, this approach and we, we look at our sound design, we subdivide the room with a monocorrelated system. It's like, I'll cover over here, you cover over there, we'll meet in the middle, we're going to be in phase with each other, we're going to couple together there, and if we can pull a pair of minus 6 dB points down there at the center, then everybody wins, and we have a happy approach, and that's something I'm very comfortable with, that's, uh, that's my stock and trade. In the world of stereo, you're going to have some level of overlap, because in the central area, people are able to at least perceive a horizontally spread image source. And so you can see I've oversized the balloons and um, I'm overlapping a bit into the walls and a bit into the center. That's going to be our straddle between the uncorrelated and the correlated worlds. For the multi-channel, we're going to take a different approach. We're going to lay uh, this guy over this guy over that guy. It's like the Venn diagram that everybody lays uh, right on top of that and they share the space. So if they're going to share the space, then you need to separate the signals. That's the deal. Over here, I've got sharing the signal and I'm separating the space. Over here, I'm sharing the space and separating the signals. And here I'm doing half of both. Just to finalize this topic, Correlated systems do uniform coverage by committee, and that is we want to cover every listener once or twice max. Uncorrelated systems do uniform coverage by channel, and we cover every listener with every channel. I'm going to go back a slide. We've all seen like left, center, right approaches where left covers half the room and right covers half the room and center covers half the room. That is a recipe for disaster because you have a uncorrelated approach uh, available to you, but you've only covered half the room, and so you end up stuck with sending correlated signals by sending center channel stuff and left and right. I think we've all seen that, and that's given LCR systems a well-deserved bad rap because so often they're poorly implemented. Now, there's going to be a bunch of map predictions, and they're going to look kind of strange because they are not the usual set of colors. I'm using basically a super simplified pass fail or go no go type of, of approach basically the color red is a zero to six db inclusive and anything else whether it's blue that's the next six db down and then black is more than 12 db down so basically we're going to concentrate on the red shape that is the shape that's included in the coverage if you're more than six db down you're definitely losing the game. You're, you're considered off axis in our normal terminology. And we're going to consider that if the sound is moving around and it's dropping 6 dB, that you're going to not really feel like you're included in that spatial magic, that you're kind of watching somebody else have a good show over somewhere else. Let's take a look now at the correlated approach to a left right system. This is the left main, and there it goes. And it's covering half the room, and it's that half the room plus extra kind of approach. Well, when I add a second one, you can see what happens. It spreads out and it actually, strangely, no longer makes it overlapping to the edge. Why? Because we have a bunch of buildup in the center. And this is where I need to explain my color scale. The color scale starts at zero dB 
by as in, hey, what's the loudest thing in the room? And it rescales, each one is rescaled based on relative level. So the loudest point in this room is most likely right at the center, and then the 6 dB is down there. So you've lost um, 6 dB by the time you reach the outside edge. If we took an uncorrelated approach, we could aim that speaker in and look at that. Wow, baby, the left speaker now covers the entire room. Everybody's in the red. We have got this place wired. So when I turn on the right speaker, if I added correlated signals with an uncorrelated design concept, look what happens. The coverage shrinks and it shrinks to only half of the room is now covered. So this is a case where more is most definitely less. And why is that happening? Because you have a correlated overlapping buildup in the center and that swamps out the signal on the sides. So this is why we don't take our stereo mains and just point them right at the center of the room. We could do that if we make an agreement to only hard pan everything left or right. Or if I wanted to have a unity approach, I would go with a narrower speaker. In this case, I've changed from the 110 degree X40 that we show, showed you in the first ones there to the 80 degree UPQD. And when it covers just a little over half the room, and when you put the two of them together, you can see you have a predictable width and it didn't shrink on the sides. And that's for the correlated approach. So that's what we do. That's, that's the world of left and right mains. What we're going to do now, instead of left and right, we are going to go and we're going to go to a multi-channel design. We're going to go from here on out and consider that we want uncorrelated channels and we're going to cover every listener with every channel. My design approach is to make a sonic planetarium. We're going to build a planetarium dome with speakers and a planetarium dome allows you to fly spaceships around um, the perimeter, they can go 360 degrees around you in the lateral plane. Okay, and they can go above you, they can get up high and still go in 360 degrees above you, not just into a static point in the center. And looking at from a horizon point of view, you can see the sun rise in the east and go overhead and then set in the west. And so that's what we're going to do with our approach. That is the basic concept that I will be outlaying for you. This is gonna proceed in basically six steps. We define the room and some terminologies that we make, the go factor, the go zone. We're gonna design the main systems, then the laterals, then the overheads. All Each of those designs includes its spacing, its height and its aim. Then we're gonna add the LF system and then we're gonna assign the processing channels so that Josh can make that map that's ready to go. So let's go and check the paperwork. This all starts with a blank piece of paper, a square piece of paper that represents our room. The perimeter of the paper is where we can hang speakers. That's the perimeter of the room. So what we do is we start to visualize this by dividing up the space. So we're going to start with it by folding it in half, folding it in half again, and we're going to fold that in half the other way, and again. And that leaves you now with 16 little squares. And that square now, what's one-fourth of the distance across, is the key parameter, it's what we call G, or the go distance. So I've taken a Sharpie and I've marked the perimeter of what we call the go zone, and that is a distance of one go distance inward, and it marks inward from each of the sides one go distance, and that is the inner perimeter from which we will design the system. That, of course, marks the place where there's the best spatialization, but it's not the exclusive spatialization area, but we call that the go zone. So let's start to place the main speakers. The speakers will be placed on the perimeter, and let's show you my little speakers icon. It's uh, I made a something that is 1G square, and it is 1G high. This represents the speaker location, and you can see that it's a 45-degree downslope to reach the front there. So I'm going to place this center main 
and we're going to make the mains pink. Why not? Um, so that's the center main. It's located on the speaker perimeter. It's 1G from the go zone, and it's 1G height. For left, you're going to space it 1G apart. Right is 1G apart. So that now we've designed a left, center, right main system. Well, what if we had a five-part main system? Well, you'd simply add these guys in between, and now they are half a G separated apart. Now, the aim point of these things, all of the horizontal aiming is going to go right to the center. So I'm going to take this little guy here, and this yellow is represents the go zone, so we can see that, keep that always in focus. And that little dot there, all the horizontal aiming is there. The vertical aiming goes from here to the opposite side and reaches this listener there. Now bear in mind that the flat paper here represents not the floor of the room, but the listening plane. That's everything, all these calculations are done off the listening plane, which is typically seated at 1.2 meters or one meter, or if it's standing, 1.5 meters. Let's move on to the rear surrounds. Rear surrounds are easy because they're going to be just like the main system. You're going to place the center rear surround in the center. You're going to space them 1G apart, and you're going to place them at a height of 1G. Now, 1G is the ideal height for these things. And what that does is it puts you at 45 degrees from the go zone perimeter. If it's higher than that, it's perceived as an overhead source. If it's lower than that, it's perceived as a lateral source. So we're right at the edge of being perceived as a lateral source. And by going high, that allows us to really get great coverage over the whole room. The lowest you should go would be half of a G down, and that's about the lowest that you can handle. So I recommend between one half and a full G. I'm showing you a full G height here. The next stop is the laterals. They are, again, spaced 1G apart, but we're going to not put them on the center. We're going to straddle the center and make sure that we make it to the outside edges. So they are spread 1G apart, 1G high, and again, they're going to aim vertically across the room and horizontally everybody goes through center. So the down angle is slightly different from this one, which is in the corner, has to go all the way to the other corner. So that angle is not as steep as one that's straight on center and has the shorter distance straight across. The diagonal is longer than the, than the bisect, but it's only a difference typically of between a half and one degree. So it's not a game changer. Now let's move on to the overhead. The overheads are placed around the go zone perimeter. You don't place them at the outer edge because we already have a speaker at the outer edge. That's the lateral, and we want to bring things up for a large amount of period. So I'm placing them there, and the height that we want is at least uh, two goes above the listening plane. So right now I've placed it at two goes ahead. Each peeper clip there is a speaker location. And the spacing is exactly the same as the height above the listeners. So it's a 2G spacing for a 2G height. If we had a low ceiling and we got stuck going down lower, well, <clears throat> going to need a couple more paper clips. Going to need um, to add these guys in, and we're going to space it 1G apart because we have just a 1G height. So instead of the four speakers that it took us to, to cover the room at a 2G height, it takes us eight speakers at this 1G height. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, around that. Okay? So that's the story. The higher you get your overheads, the better uh, you'll get more of the room. Where are they angled? Well, they're aimed horizontally right through the center. Once again, we're just always aiming for this spot. And vertically, you want to aim them at one half of a go past the center. So that would be this location here, that location there, this location there. That would be where these guys would aim. Not every uh, room is a square. 
So what if we had a rectangular shape, a little more, uh, it wasn't the same on all sides. Let's make this shape here. Uh, it's a rectangle. Well, what do you do? You've expanded the go zone. The go zone calculation is still based on the skinniest side. So it's still this, it's still this same distance. The mains don't change. The center changes. The center is now, of course, right here. And that is where everybody aims through. The rears don't change. We have to expand the laterals, but the spacing of the laterals stays the same. And everybody, this now has a longer distance to go, and all the more critical for it to be of a, of a, at the full go height. What about the overheads? Well, I'm going to go back to 2G overhead paradigm. <clears throat> And what we can see there, of course, we're just going to have to continue the overheads one, two, three, four, five, six. It would take six overheads to do this room instead of the four that we had for the square room. Okay, so that's uh, the world of uh, origami. I want to thank my experiences of my many trips to Japan, which is responsible for that approach. Of course, what's not mentioned in that is the characteristics of the loudspeaker, the coverage angles of the loudspeaker. So which is better, wide or narrow? Well, the obvious answer is wide. Let's just get to that because your job is to cover the whole room. When we wanna do correlated systems and we wanna do surgical approaches where everything is about intelligibility and minimizing any kind of interactions of loudspeakers, then we wanna um, use speakers with tight patterns. But here we're going to take a approach of cover everybody with all of the sources. So we've got to go wide. Let's look now at some of the fingerprints of some of the speakers that we use in our toolbox here at Meyer Sound. This is the Ultra X23. It's a 110 by 110 degree speaker. And I've placed it straight overhead at a, at a distance of 2G. So it's basically functioning as a, a center channel overhead. And you can see that for that 20 by 20 meter space that it's looking into, it's covered 19 by 19. So that is a way to look at a speaker and instead of really thinking about it in terms of angles is to think about coverage area. I'm thinking about coverage in meter per meter for 10 meters of uh, travel. I have a 19 by 19 meter area that's covered. That's a very good return on investment there. Looking at its um, sister, the Ultra X20, which is wide in one plane, but narrow in the other, you can see that I got still my 19, but I've got only half as much in the other plane. So I've just got 10 by 19. So I lost a lot of coverage area. And then the other sister there, another extreme is the leopard. It's 110 degrees still, we've still got our 19, 20 meters, but we're only two and a half meters wide. So this is a tool you can see that's probably not a great tool for our use. You're going to be surprised to find out that there are applications for the leopard. We will cover that later. It's when things get quite extreme, that's when you're going to pull into extreme speakers. So if you take a look at the Meyer Sound family, I've basically indexed everybody by their shapes. And the key factor, the first one to consider is the amount of asymmetry. Well, these are the three speakers that we just saw and the x23 is the least asymmetric it's the most symmetric so it's a great choice for a high overhead speaker that wants to cover a very squarish type of shape um, as we get into more rectangulated something like the x20 that you see as you move down the list of increasing rectangularity then that becomes more applicable to lateral applications and even overhead locations where you have a rectangular shape rather than a square or a round shape that you're trying to fill up. So when you want to uh, rectangulate, these tools come in handy. Then you can see the leopard. Well, the leopard has a symmetry of uh, four to one. It's really severe. And so that's going to only be applicable when we are in very, very deep rectangular spaces and we have to fire from a very, very low position. So sometimes we get stuck because of low ceilings or other troubles 
to hit these spaces from very low angles. And in those cases, you have to get over the heads of the near people in order to get deep into the space. And that's where tools like the Leopard will come in handy. Looking back at this guy again, we're gonna take another approach and this is the square meter approach. And if you look now at a UP4 Slim, it's a shrunken version. It's still quite symmetrical, but it's 13 by 12 as opposed to the 19 by 19 that you saw before. And then we get smaller yet. This is the UPA 2P and it is seven by seven meters. So for a distance that it travels of 10, it returns you seven. It's the incredibly shrinking speaker. So its application is, is surgical fill. It's a correlated uh, system speaker. It's not designed for this world. So we're gonna just say any speaker that's narrow in two dimensions is completely not the tool for our job. Uh, UP4 is, is still a workable speaker. It's at least expanding in both dimensions and it's quite symmetrical. So it's good for overhead and high applications. It's not gonna do well for low applications. So there they are. You can see the UPA 2P is at the bottom of our list in terms of it's got nearly the minimum coverage area. So the actual winner being the JM1P, but the X20, which has 360 square meters, for a 10 meter height, that's quite amazing. HMS 12, one of the surround speakers from our cinema line, also is quite wide, UP4 Slim, UPM1P. The UPQ D3 is a highly symmetrical, it's 80 by 80. So that's a something that we like to see in overhead applications. And then the X20 with its 110 by 40 and the the X40 and the X20, those two well. So you can see, I'll leave, you know, you'll have a, the ability to check this chart anytime that you want. In terms of the spacing, what I'm telling you is this is a simplified chart. If you go, I'm, I'm assuming the 110 degree type of, of tools, and you can still use this exact approach for narrower speakers. You're just going to get less overlap, less immersion. It's still the same approach. You're still going to aim them the same places and you can space them the same you'll just simply get the party started later you basically shrink the area that is the immersion in terms of power scaling that is a creative choice of how much of your content how important is it that you're moving the content if you've got king kong going around the entire room your application is a 360 degree theater with you know, video screens all around you and you've got King Kong stopping his feet all around, you're going to need comparable power in all lateral. And when he climbs to the top of the Empire State Building, he's going to get loud up there too. So you've got to have power everywhere. But if you have a situation where the, the power load in the smaller areas is scaled to something uh, less dramatic, well, you're going to drop them down six or maybe 12 dB. It's all about what your content is and what your budget is. Um, a note about scale. Everything I'm going to show you to today is going to be on a 20 meter perimeter, but it is scalable. It could be smaller. It could be bigger. It's all about ratios. That's why I use the G factor to explain this because that sets you up for a scalable parameter. 45 degrees, that's a key differentiator for our perception, but it's based on the geometry of the go zone, which scales with your shape. So that's the approach here. And one quick note about room acoustics, I'll just make it real simple. Do we want to have a bunch of room reflections? The answer is no. Please give us a dead room because a dead room means we can create the spatial movement rather than having to fight with phantom images off of walls and uh, reflective surfaces. We're already, shall we say, taking a huge risk in terms of our intelligibility by spreading our sources all over the room. So don't add a lot of marble and glass to the equation if you can too. Okay, so just to remember, Space Map is an application. It's the virtual part. This is the real part. It's about real coverage. That's what I'm concerned with here. You're gonna see the same thing that we went through in the video, except I'm gonna put numbers to it. So I've started with the 22 by 22 meter square space. That's where the walls are. We can't embed the speakers into the wall, which gives us then our first measurement, which I call the speaker perimeter. 
that's the area inside of which the speakers are located. You're going to use up a meter to get your speaker properly hung because you're going to want to have, you know, your speaker's going to be able to pan and tilt, you're not just going to face straight out. Um, get away from the, the cinema surround where they're just flat onto the surface. That's not going to work. We've got to get our speakers aimed down and in. The laterals need full pan and tilt capability. So let's figure that it costs us a meter inward. We've got a 20 meter remainder. That's my speaker perimeter. So there it is. I've made our color there. And so now we define the go zone. Well, I showed you how to do that. It's one fourth of the distance across. And so there it is. It's five meters is one G because it's square. It's the same distance on all sides. So the go zone is now a 10 by 10 meter square. Okay, so there it is. That's your go zone. Let's now start with the main system spacing. The main system spacing, the first thing to understand is it wants to be spread across the same distance as the go zone. So it's essentially a 2G spread. Why not go all the way to the corners? Well, think about this. I want you to place yourself at the symphony. You don't put the violins out on the exact corner of the hall. You spread the musicians close enough together, spread them as wide as you can, but keep them close enough together so that they can make music together. I think it's better to keep your frontal system confined, but this is, you know, sometimes reality is going to go because you have a different stage size, these kind of things. But these are guidelines. These are a starting place. So that's my way to go. I divide it up. And in this case, that means you have a 1G spacing for a three-part system. And then if it was a five-section system, it would be a half-go spacing. And if you went to seven, maybe you might start to creep outside of that, or you would place them even tighter. Here is that aiming. You can see a different aim, horizontal aim angle for each one in order to bring you across to the center. The perimeter of the go zone is, is used to set up for the lateral sources and to consider their height. And that's where we make the 45 uh, degree determination. That means if, if you're at a 1G height, these people will perceive it as 45 degrees. It's right at the edge of lateral and overhead. For everybody going further away, they're going to perceive it as a lateral. And for these people who are you're really close, this small percentage of the audience, yes, they're going to actually perceive that source as high. But the cost of bringing that source all the way so it's a low source to the very first seat is that you will never get any penetration deep into the room. So this is the cost of doing business. You want to be spatial for a larger number of people. These people in here are going to pay in terms of overhead perception in order for all of us to get this spatial experience. It's that principle of Tonstoffel that anybody knows I'm a huge fan of. You've got to give up something. There's no such thing as a free lunch. So this is that um, very thing that I just described to you. At a height of 1G, this person who's on the go zone perimeter sees that speaker as at 45 degrees. At half a G, they're at 26. And at 3 quarters G, they're at 37. And you can see, obviously, everyone behind them or further away from them sees that all of these in the lateral perception. This is where we aim it. We aim it at the last listener on the opposite side. We aim it this way because we're going to use the characteristics of loudspeaker projection so that we can get over these people without it getting too loud um, in order to get the maximum penetration across the room. So these are some coverage option um, examples. We're going to place speaker high, medium, and low. We're going to use a wide speaker and a narrow speaker. What I want to show you is what happens when we move up and down, what happens when we try uh, different models of speakers. So here we have a speaker that's high and wide. How is it doing? Well, you can see we've got almost the whole room is inside uh, the coverage. We've got all of the go zone and a lot more. So this is the start of that concept I told you before how about how you've got much more coverage than just the go zone. But what if we used a 70 degree speaker instead of that 110 degree speaker? Well, you can see we got the go zone, but we missed the rest of the room. So this would be um, that a kind of approach where that go zone really is the only place this event is happening. So that shows that's not a great choice. 
Now we've taken back to the wide speaker and we've brought ourselves down to the three quarter G position. And you can see we've still got the whole go zone, but we have a shrinking share of the speaker. So now I'm going to go to that narrow speaker and the 70 degree speaker is really shrinking even more. Now I've gone to the low position. This is the half G position. So whereas we had covered the whole go zone and almost the whole room when we were in the high position, now we cannot even finish the whole go zone from this low position with the wide speaker and with the narrow speaker got about a third of the go zone. So that is a total non-starter. So what's the answer to that? Go high and go wide. Let's now start to move around and see what it happens when I go from this left main and I'll do the five speakers across, okay? I've taken a little dotted line and that's kind of what I consider to be the full immersion area. You can see it's, it extends beyond the go zone, but there's the left side coverage. There's left center, there's center, there's right center, there's right. You can see that we made it all the way across and everybody covered the full go zone and a lot more as we moved across. And this is a three quarter G design. So we're at that middle height. So we'll do even better when we have the full G height. We would do not as well if we had the half G height. So let's move to the laterals. The thing about the laterals is I want to kind of connect with the main systems, but I'm personally not a big fan of going right into corners. I know some people are. The corners are a uh, have a whole lot of acoustical issues. They will make your speaker not match all the other speakers because of all of the nasty things that happen in corners. So I prefer to start out of the corner by going a half a go beyond. And that means you just, like I showed you in the origami, don't go on the center. You start half a G off and then you'll stagger yourself that way. So you can see there, um, I've got four speakers across. They're all at a 1G spacing and off we go so here's side surround one side surround two three and four and you can see everybody is covering yes sir. i want to reiterate the the go zone is just a tool for spacing and angling your speakers but we can see from these coverage angles that you see that uh, most of the perimeter of the coverage zone is absolutely 100 percent in coverage uh, of all of these loudspeaker sources so just pay attention to where the red is in this room like he said so when i go to the rear we're just continuing this same approach um rear surround and that's basically a copy of the front system, except that it's a three part in this case. OK, so let's look at our planetarium overhead. I've got a, a 2G spacing and you can see this is how we make this dome happen. These are the high guys and this is this is how it's going to work. So if I'm at 1G, then I'm going to be perceived at the go zone perimeter as just 45 degrees overhead. And at 1G, these people here, I'm at less than 45 degrees. So it's kind of lateral-ish. At 2Gs, I'm perceived at 45 degrees, the ambiguous point, at the very edge. And everybody outside of the edge sees you as more than 45 degrees above. So that's what the beauty of that 2G height is, is it's A, perceived by everybody as overhead and is also going to give you the advantage of more square meters of coverage. So with the 2G height, then I yield a 2G spacing. And remember, it's actually 11 meters because I'm using a one meter spacing. I have a short people sitting height. Why do I use one meter? Because I'm lazy, because it just drives you nuts to have a 0.2 meter in all of your multiplications. I think you probably in the end, most people will appreciate it. So there's my horizontal aim. And, and then my vertical aim is past the center. It was pointed out to me yesterday that it's a better way to say that instead of a half a G past the center is half the distance between the center and the go zone perimeter because it will elongate on the diagonals and it will be slightly shorter on the bisect. So if a speaker was here, it would aim at exactly half a go, but if it was going from the corner, it's gonna go half that distance, which is a little longer because that's a longer distance. 
as the crow flies. I'm going to address the overhead speaker. This is a center overhead, which is the way that people usually think about overhead speakers. And it turns out you notice that I've never placed a speaker in the center. And that's because we can get to the center by a virtual node, which Josh has probably explained to you all. It buses you to multiple sources. And so they together sum and become a center image. But the coverage is the worst. The, the worst place to try to cover the floor is aiming straight down. As we move off of the center and angle in, you get this elongation of coverage. You get more square meters of coverage. And the further you move off, the more you, you get. Of course, if you move too far, now you're starting to lose your overhead perception. So this is kind of the place. And there you are straight over the edge of the go zone. So this is now an Alta X40. That's placed at 90 degrees. That's aimed straight down. And that's the smallest amount of area you can get. And then as we go here, we can get 13 by 12 facing straight down at this height. And this is 14 by 18. You can see we expanded from 13 by 12 to 14 by 18 to move there. And it expands even more if we move there but we can't move there because now we're going to be perceived by a lot of people as just a lateral source. So this is the way to go. We're going to mount speakers, overhead speakers on the go zone perimeter. That's another usage of the go zone. Remember, it's not about where it's a guideline for placement and more so than it is a guideline for where the action is. So this is our placement now for this application. I've got four on the corners and you can see them angled in and with a X20, it does a beautiful job because it's wider horizontally than it is vertically, which allows you to get deep across the room without too much going straight down. This is the X23, the 110 by 110. And I got no argument with that one either. With this square room, it does really well. You can see it even covers directly underneath it, which is a pretty amazing thing. So then this is the wrong choice, the X22, which is the 70 degree speaker. Again, too narrow. Yeah, we got the, the center area, but we know we could cover a lot more room with a wider speaker. So now that you've done your overheads, that leaves you with low frequencies. The low frequencies are going to have to spread around the room, and we need a lot less of them because there's no worry about them having wide enough coverage angle. That's a done thing. Of course, there's nothing good from a low frequency point of view that happens from doing this spread out low frequency facing inward. Who does that except for a disco? As sound engineers, we have very strong feelings about disco approaches and for low end. It's like where just just move two feet and get a new low end. Well, that's that's reality for correlated signals. We're going to use correlated signals and they're going to link to the virtual nodes here. So this speaker here will be linked to these areas and josh will have shown you how to do that so that so now as the helicopter moves around or king kong stomps around we can move the low end there but we're not going to have all the low end going at once unless we want to just make a comb filter experience that's that okay and that's really what i wanted to cover today and so i haven't gone too far over time so we've got ourselves set up to do two more of these the the next steps will be to go beyond the simple square we're going to go and get different shapes of rooms we're going to rectangulate we're going to add a uh, rake into the floor we're going to add a balcony we're going to do all the things that are going to make life more difficult but that are part of what really happens in the real world but we, but today i wanted to get the concept of how of how your your perceived spatialization and the decorrelated um, approach to system design the first question that we had was did i hear bob say a flush mounted hms to the room perimeter is not optimal there is a mounting way you can do that as it's native in its original designed environment, which is a cinema speaker. It has a limited amount of swivel. It's the way those things are made because in the world of cinema, it's not expected to need a substantial amount of pan. It's got a swivel on the tilt and very limited on the pan, but you can be done. Uh, you simply have to get it mounted off of the wall enough to swivel it out. What I really was trying to emphasize was the approach, the cinema approach, and don't, don't fixate on 
the Meyer speakers at all. Um, any cinematic approach, you go to the cinema and what you look over when you look, you see a whole bunch of speakers and every one of them is flat mounted onto the wall facing straight across the room, angled down, but, but horizontally straight across the room. That's the approach that we're not going to do. Cool. Next week, we have uh, Roundtable 2, and we're going to, as Bob said, we're going to expand upon this concept that Bob just introduced today, and we're going to bring it out into real-world shapes. And then Roundtable 3, to me, is going to be very interesting because we're going to scale this to multi-balcony systems as well as arenas and stadiums. But what's cool about it is we're going to dedicate a lot of that time to talk about where to make the design compromises and where to make the right choice when you need to cut things as far as budget or you know rigging or whatever the case may be that your production manager is telling you you can't hang a speaker where you want to hang it. So design considerations for the real world is something that is super important. So we're going to be covering that. That's it for me. Bob, do you have anything else? That's it. I want to thank everybody for coming. It's a fun project. I feel like I'm working for the other side now. I'm working for chaos instead of control. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but it's been fun, um, and uh, I, I really like spatial uh, immersion audio. It can be great stuff. I started to do my I did my first systems with LCS back uh, at Disney uh, in Tokyo, and. Uh, and it was really fun, and I'm still I'm still a fan. So, thank you for uh, making it all happen. Um, thanks to everybody uh, in the background, and I hope that uh, we will see you uh, soon uh, next week because we still have a lot more to go. It'll get more interesting as we go. But there's your fundamentals. Yep, absolutely. Well, have a great week, and we'll see you next week, guys. Thanks. <laughs>